Question from Larry, WA2CNV. What's the weight bearing of the entire unit and how big are the rolling casters? Oh, uh, I think uh, Larry and I could do a dance on this thing and not be a problem. It's two 30-foot, what I call hourglass pedestals. So if you've ever seen them, they're rack pedestals. So they're about 30 inches high, 30 inches deep. And inset, there's rack ears, 19-inch rack ears inset to it. I didn't take a picture of the lower part because it's kind of cluttered with household stuff. But basically, I can mount equipment on the rack below that if I really want to. And it's got a piece of metal that's about six inches wide on each side. It's not straight. I mean, it's like C-channel type stuff that comes up from the base and then has gusset plates on the top and the bottom to support the top and bottom plates. It's all welded and painted. It's got eight wheels on it, for gosh sakes. Eight wheels in a four foot by two foot square. I mean, it's pretty horrendously strong. Good question. Okay, so uh, that's all I have here, Gordon. Back to you, unless someone else does. So there are three general types of amateur. There's the casual one, you know, I'm a ham, but I have other things to do. There's the intense one, like people like to go contesting or traffic handling or whatever intent, whatever they do, they do it in with intensity and they do it maybe for longer durations, even if it's in like a sprint kind of mode for an evening, they they're very intense about what they do uh, in ham radio. And then there's the experimental guys. Yeah. They, they fiddle with stuff. They're the ones who learned not to solder in the summer wearing shorts at their ham shack. I think we've all seen that. The casual person is the knob spinner, rag chewer, you know, opportunist at DXing, working poda and soda stations, some tinkering, you know, just a general purpose ham. The intense person, as I said, is the contester, the DX to the net, the round table person, you know, whatever. They really get into it. And experimentals, as I said, for gosh sakes, you know, don't spill the solder on your bare leg in the summer. We've all done that, I think, at least once. And if you haven't, then you have it. <laughs> <laughs> try it you won't like it and that's also the t the ham who tends to have other things going on in their ham shack because not their ham shack tends to also have maybe test equipment and stuff so let's look at that what are the functional elements in a ham shack microphones keyers and audio tools all complement the radios not to mention now computers you look at pictures of, of ham stations 40 years ago no one had a display in there you started to see them 30 years ago or you know maybe starting 40 years ago in the 80s started to see computers show up and pointing to us you need to have room for a mouse you need to have room for a keyboard or a touchpad or whatever you use you have amplifiers i mean my amplifiers some of them i really need to actually keep an eye on uh, i i have a two meter kilowatt here i like to i actually like to make sure that it's a happy camper because it's a an old uh, henry uh, tempo uh, 2002 so I, I like to make sure that we're not going to fry the beast but you got meters and you got switches for audio and switches for for antennas and switches for PTTs and all kinds of things. Uh, I, one thing I kind of glossed over, but you you also may have things like audio shaping devices or video shaping devices. Our, our stations are becoming highly integrated with video. I mean, we have cameras in our ham shacks now, present company here, right? I mean, most of us have one form or another of a camera in our ham shack. You might also want a TV so you can watch for public events or, you know, maybe you want to watch the Stanley Cup or why would you want to watch anything else? And weather, obviously, and other services. Sometimes those services, the local oscillator to the IF will cause problems inside your ham shack. You won't even know about it. So getting all that stuff squared away can be a nuisance at times. Then the last couple of things, power supplies, batteries, various kinds of controllers for everything from hot spots to, you know, uh, weather thingies to, you know, how to point my antennas, uh, any manner of thing. Uh, you have your network stuff, right? Gr bonding and grounding stuff, uh, chokes. Uh, sometimes you need to have that choke coming right out of the radio or right out of the amplifier to keep the RF down. And in some cases, you might need to have the lightning protection right at the bulkhead of your entry point to your ham shack. Jersey, I had to do that. I did it very successfully with no issues. Next one. So conflicting elements, and these all cause problems, right? Comfort, your seating, your posture, your focal space. What is your focus? Turning the knob of a radio? Is it diddling a keyboard? Is it a mouse? Is it a key? Is it the mic for your QSO? What is it? Is it the camera? 
any number of things. So now all of a sudden, your focal space, it's not just your visual focal space, but where do you need to put your hands or feet? Do you need a foot switch? Those kinds of things. All those different kinds of components make choices complex, but at the same time, done right, they can make life very comfortable to operate in whatever form you find attractive with an amateur radio. Dick Nadel, uh, K2RIW, used to say that there were 29 discrete types of amateur radio, and he thought that may be an un... So, God bless him. Uh, I miss Dick mightily. Power. You have different types of power. You got to move AC power. You got to move 12 volt power. You might have to move 14.6 power because lithium batteries, but you also still may need 12 volt power for things that can't handle 14.6 power. You might need 24 or 48 volt power for your networking gear. You don't know. You have backup power and your requirements. RF noise in the shack. Oh my gosh. I can't tell you the fun it was to initially turn on an amplifier in this ham shack and watch my network disappear. The switch, the network switch, along with the computer and also the radio. So when I keyed up the transmitter with the amplifier, the RF took out the network. Now, all of a sudden, I had no connectivity. <laughs> Oops. So you have to take measures to fix that. So what did I do? Number one, CAT7 cables are your friend. If you can't get CAT7, get CAT6E shielded cable. And the other thing you can do that's absolutely lovely DX engineering, DX ISO pluses, they're ridiculously expensive for any of your Ethernet stuff. They also will not carry voltage. So if you have PoE, you can't use them. You have to find another way to get power around them. I literally buy boxes of chokes. I mean, I buy snap on ferrites by the box five millimeter, seven millimeter, nine millimeter, 13 millimeter, whatever. I got big ones, small ones. This is one of my boxes. And you buy them in bulk and snap them on things when things start going sideways and your problems go away. Actually, when you start to put way too much stuff in your ham shack at the same time, because you will over time, even if it's only two or three or four things, that's that could be more than you thought. I want to point out something here. Not only do you have interference from AC power and switch mode power supplies, but you also have to think about what could generate fire, what could generate electrical shock. Oh, by the way, you could fall down and hurt yourself. It's not so much hitting the floor that's the issue. It's what are you going to hit on the way to the floor and what part of your body was it? If it's your shoulder, you're just cursing and swearing. If it's your head, you might be unconscious on the floor. Think about that when you have your cluttered ham shack. Yeah, little human factors, little tidying up doesn't hurt. QRM, RF and acoustic. One of the guys was telling me that he only can operate FT8 because his wife does not want to hear him calling CQ or does not want to hear him talking to someone on the radio in the other room while she's watching 90 Day Bride or something. You know, so be it. Access to the rear equipment, I think we've covered that, but let me bring up another thing. On the, You saw my big ham desk here, but one of the future improvements is for the stuff that's under the shelf will be to have a mini shelf that's propped up. I have a, a small version of it, but I'm going to have it the whole length, and I'll be able to slide the whole thing out. So if I don't want to reach over and displace the monitors, I can also just pull the whole row out and get to the back of the radios right here at a very comfortable height, you know, right literally in the free space from the the bulkhead where the radios are on the shelf to the edge of the desk is 20 inches now a little bit of it right now is being encroached upon by the transceivers in future iteration i'll have a full 21 inches of open desk space between the radios and the edge of the table full 21 more is better i mean start with a four by eight sheet of plywood and put them back to back if you want if you're going to have exposed wood support it as best you can and make it so that your legs can go across and not hit supports that's another important thing that helps with safety as well as convenience got the spaces behind at every level i've got a space at the desk level i've got a space at the shelf level 
both in front of the monitors underneath them and behind the equipment in essentially a cable fall area in the back. So it really is nice. The other thing is, as I mentioned before, I really dislike where my antennas come in. A power is good. I'm good for that. I can just reach over and drop all the power. A mess when it comes to the antennas. The things to think about first, your desk and your chair. If you're going to use plywood, and a file cabinet, you've all seen that pick double up on the plywood, get three quarter inch plywood and rip foot of it or 10 inches of it down the length and make that a shelf or use that as a side table, but double up. If you're going to use it exposed, take the smooth side and have one side facing up, one side facing down and put the rough sides together, screw and glue them together from underneath. The other thing is urethane, urethane, urethane. If you're going to use plywood, just go to town with urethane, a uh, spar varnish, whatever, and put multiple coats on, literally dump it on and, and then smooth it out. The file cabinet underneath, that's one approach. I'm not a big fan of that, by the way. Plastic tables, that's fine. But what about weight? You know, we talked about that, right? Manufactured wood. You saw the the, the four by two foot desktop that I made the little hutch uh, for, the for the house. Actually, it was made Actually, for in back in Bergen. Bergen. That's Bergen. also very good. A Formica countertop. They often have a, a backsplash. The problem is they're not very deep. They're only typically about 30 inches deep. And also they're underneath the Formica is usually particle board. So if you have any moisture, it's going to come apart. And it, also, if you reconfigure it over where it's get rough treatment, it will start to flake and come apart. So you really don't want, I'm not a big fan of this unless you're going to put for like on hardwood or plywood, not, not part of racks are nice, but they're not for everybody because they're not convenient. You can kind of keep an eye on stuff, whether it's a desktop rack or a rolling rack. Same thing with cabinets. There are people who put their whole ham station in a storage cabinet. The whole hams, you're comfortable with that? That works for you? That's, again, power AC and DC. Where are you going to get your antenna? And ventilation to the space. You must be comfortable. It can't be too cold. It can't be too hot. It can't be too sweaty. You can't have the bugs biting you. That kind of nonsense. So look at those factors on the right side. You know, think about those things too. This is that picture close up. Plates are bonded through and also grounded to the ground ring on the outside here. And the lightning arresters are down on about a foot off the ground, two feet, three feet behind this, but down about six feet. So I mean, this is just a mess. I, I'm not proud of this. All right. So let's look at some other people. So this gentleman did a respectable job. It's kind of organic, but maybe a little better done. It's got a much nicer countertop, but you notice underneath there's no supports that grab your knees. So he's got angular supports lagged into the walls, you know, like a triangles holding that desktop up. It's a little shallow. I mean, you can see that Kenwood uh, 820, I think it is. And you know how big that is. So this is probably a two foot deep desk. And he basically ate it all with his radio. He's got no room in front. So that's a problem. That's a huge problem. But I mean, it's a nice overall concept. And it's a much stouter desktop. And he's got some sort of facing on it. I mean, mine, you can still look at the front edge of the plywood. So, I mean, this is really nice. You, you did a nice job with this part, but it's not deep enough. This guy, again, he had some stuff he put on the, on the shelf. You got to wonder whether any of this gear in the shelves works or is powerable. Because I know if I took that HQ, whatever it is, 180 maybe, that's on the shelf here and powered it up, I don't think it would last very long because I think it would overheat. But, you know, you can see how he's a radio guy. His right hand is by his keyboard and his knob. This is, he's a radio guy. He's a guy who tunes the radio. He tunes around. So his focus is the radio with some attention to logging and or digital modes. You can see that. See that? See how that? And he's got, by the way, he's got his, his, I just noticed this. He's got a TL822, the uh, Kenwood amp on a shelf. God bless him. I don't know how he keeps that cool. But Mo Mazel Tov. It's, I mean, it's a great answer. I mean, I mean as, as long as he keeps it cool, I guess it works for him. Here's another guy. So a couple of guys. This guy, this is actually in a tent. But I thought this was a good picture. So he's got his station. You see how the radios are nice angled up, you know? So he's got the human factor thing going. He's got his little laptop thing going. 
So he's a radio guy who comfortable in a portable environment. I think that might be a key here on top. So somewhere there's got to be a key for a portable operation. And it's about a three or four foot square, maybe a, a three foot by two foot or four foot by two foot table. It's got his Elecraft radio. And I think that's an Elecraft amp, you know, sitting next to it with a laptop. Good for him. And this guy, he repurposed some common desk furniture and his overflow is definitely that file cabinet. No question about it. The problem is all of this wood over here is particle board. So it, if he overloads it, he will see this equipment on his ankles. And you can see the cable fall in the back is uh, a little scary. But we all do this at, at varying levels. So organizing your cables and choking them is important. I think he's comfortable. He's, he definitely uses his computer at a good height. Maybe a little low for me, but that's fine. But his radio is at a decent height and his tuners and his amplifier is kind of observable, but out of the way. Good stuff. I think this guy did an overall good job. This guy's another one that's a good job. He's clearly a radio guy. There's the radio. There's the other radio. There's his other radio in the middle. And oh, by the way, he does a little laptop action as a secondary display on it. That's very nice. Again, simple, modest. Not very big, but it's enough. It's got two laptops there, actually, or maybe a laptop and a tablet. So you can see how different people approach things. Now, this this was very nice. This is 84ES, three monitors. He's very task-oriented. This is where an operator operates. He uses his radio. He looks at his computer, and he's got his keyboard. He's got his mouse. He's got his key. Oh, this guy is ready to go. This is an intense operator. He's all about operating. You can tell just by looking at him. If you read his bio, I think you can see that too. Another one. Small station, but again, very nice. It's got a nice monitor with a cute little video on it. It's got his radio. It's got his keyboard. It's got his mouse. You know, very basic station, but everything is there. Everything's there, including his rotate. I think that's a rotator control box. Very nice. Again, very simple, clean stuff. These guys are operators. They like to operate. They don't want to sit there and solder at the station. They hopefully have everything at a good height. I mean, the monitors seem to be at a good height. The radio seemed to be angled up appropriately. So there'll be less fatigue. It's all good. This guy, I don't know. He's a radio guy. He loves his radios. But man, looking at these screens, wow, I don't know. It's hard to tell from his posture whether these are okay. These are probably okay, but these upper two are brutal. I mean, I'd want them down at the same level as these other monitors. That's just me. But again, this guy is, an, is a radio guy. He likes to operate. He, he, by the way, it looks to me like he's got a little tinkering action going on over here in front of his amplifier. Something's there with a, is that a multimeter or something? It's got something going on that doesn't look like it's uh, in a state of completion. And here's his cable bundle. So anytime I look at what's coming through my wall, I look at this, I feel better. And again, this is a good station. And I'm sure it works great. He's got his switch boxes for all kinds of different stuff here. But this cable stuff through the window thing, yay, yay, yay. And clearly he's an accomplished operator. Look at the plaque. This guy knows what he's doing. Good on him. And now we're back to this. So you saw the picture before the clutter. But if you notice that there's some boxes here and there's a row of boxes here, that means there's an aisle here. So remember I said you got to make sure you keep your shack clean. This is the way it is right now. It's a mess. It's going to be redone. This is all going to get removed, probably along with what's on this shelf is going to get removed. And just to open up the floor space, that'll open up about two feet by eight. And then I'll think about redoing the desk. We're not hoarders, by the way. We're improvisers who need inventory. That's a key point. So that's what's in these boxes. Resources. They're resources. So just always remember that. So if someone tells you you're a cam hoarder, tell them you're an, you're an improviser who needs inventory. That's a very important thing. 